Hello and welcome to another episode of the Influential Nonprofit. I am here with my friend Sean. Like, can I just say your last name correctly? Maybe from the first time, because Kasovsky. Perfect. You nailed right? it. Right. Hey, I come from a long line of Bedronskys and Rudkowskis, so. <laughs> So, so I got it. I got you. Okay. And Sean is the nonprofit fixer. So we're going to fix stuff today. Uh, <laughs> and you have been an ED, well, you just said five times. Yes. All right. And so you're a coach, consultant, trainer, strategic advisor. And for mind the gap consulting, you have all of this lived experience that you basically like reinvented into a way to help other EDs. Correct. Yes, Absolutely. All right. And we're going to talk about fundraising, which is what you love. Yay. I'm a little bit of a nonprofit nerd. I love fundraising. I probably was offered several of my ED positions because I specifically said on the interview, I love fundraising and I'm going to, if you want to grow, hire me. <laughs> You're hired. Yes. <laughs> okay. So before we get into that, I always start with the same question, which is tell me there's something you're proud of that you don't get to brag about a lot. Um, I think the thing I'm proud of that I don't get to brag about enough is that, um, uh, well, there's a couple things, but I think the thing I'm most proud of that I don't get to brag about is probably my public speaking ability. I love public speaking. I don't get to do it, especially since COVID. There's been very few chances to do public speaking, but I really engage. I love engaging audiences, usually as a trainer. Uh, but I love speaking wherever I can. It just lights me up. Being able to connect with large groups of people, uh, I love that. Me too. Because when you light up, you light everyone else up. That's true. Right. That that true. and that and then uh, that that just fe fills the soul, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> it does. It really, really does. I did a um, a keynote the other day, and uh, I don't know. You do that, and you're just flying. I just felt, you know, it it feels good. Okay, so let's talk about, I want to start with the big one. What is what is the role of the executive director in fundraising? How do you see their role? It's everything. They are the top fundraiser for the organization. They might not love it. They might see it as an afterthought. They might see it as a necessary evil. They might see it as something they delegate to a development director or lament the fact that the board doesn't do enough of it. Whatever it is, the executive director is ultimately the top fundraiser in the organization. So even if you have a development team or consultants, the ED is the one that funders, program officers, donors, they want to hear from, right? So you need to make yourself available, close those deals, you know, making sure that you're part of the ask and really creating the conditions for fundraising success for the long term. That's what the ED is doing is laying the groundwork, making sure your team and the technology and the, and the pitch, all of that stuff is out there. So the ED is really driving the train. Right. So they're creating the conditions. And then one of the things that I heard you say, they they could maybe come in and they're going to seal the deal. They're going to, because that's who people really want to connect with. Is that what you're saying? Unless the ED is just really clumsy at, at pitching and really clumsy at closing deals, they should be at and present for every major gift solicitation. So whether that's in person or whether it's at the podium at the annual event, if everyone just keeps seeing that it's the development director or the board chair, people are going to wonder why the executive director isn't doing that, right? So I really do believe the ED should have their team be setting up these appointments and they kind of go in and close the deal. You need to sort of be the top communicator for your organization to be successful in fundraising as the ED. So how do you, so you just said people don't like it. They sort of delegate, which I'm going to use the word abdicate it to other people, consultants, development team. How can you, how do you get them comfortable in this role? Cause it, it is really critical. And I a hundred percent believe, you know, and not just believe it, I know it because I've seen it, what you're saying. I think part of it is mindset. I used to not think this, but I've, I've come around to the idea that if you see fundraising as a as a, a necessary evil, or if you see it as asking someone for a favor, or if you see it as a burden, you're not going to enjoy doing it. I see it differently. I see it as like an incredibly generous act to invite someone to fund and create the movement and the world that they want to see. We all want less pollution, less cancer, and less starvation, right? So if we all want this, donate. 
you're the donor, I'm the doer, it's a partnership, just invite people to the cause. Like, why would we ever not invite people to solve problems? So and then if you just see it as moving wealth from where it lives to where it can change lives. If wealth is sitting around in a bunch of bank accounts doing nothing, but in my bank account, it can change the world, I'm going to move that money. <laughs> so yeah. Move money to the field. That's right, just right. A joyful and experience. Yeah. One of the things I say a lot is people don't give because of your cause, they give through your cause. So they're giving to align their highest ideals, their assets to their highest ideals and values. And those values are reflected in what your organization is doing or putting out into the world. It's not because of it, it's it's through it, right? Like there's a, and, and so you're giving somebody an opportunity to align their assets with their highest values and ideals, you know, and, 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 and you know, standing in the vision for what they want to see in the world, which is a whole different thing than, oh, give to us because we need this. It's like, give to us because I know it's important to you to see this happen in the world. Right. It's a, you're doing the donor a favor. It may not feel like it when you're doing it or when you're reaching out to friends or calling someone during dinner, but you are doing them a favor. No one's ever offended when they're asked for money. They may be bothered if you call during dinner, but they're never offended that you ask them to contribute to a good cause. No one's offended, right? We don't want to offend our friends by asking, but they're never offended. No one's offended when they're asked to contribute to something good. Yeah. Um, okay. And then you said, I be okay. What you said before was I didn't, maybe you're kind of new to understanding or like, I didn't realize how much mindset played into your actions. Like now you're in my wheelhouse <laughs> right. because, and that's truly why I started moved my business into more helping people shift their thinking, because that's what I was, I saw people truly struggling with is there's plenty of strategies, toolkits, tips, scripts, but if your heart is pounding or you feel like you're going to be a burden or offend someone, none of that is going to work. Right. And I think over time, I used to believe it was mostly skill-based. And when I was younger, I sort of was good at it, but I didn't really see it as a mindset issue. But as I've gotten older and as I've done more work and as I've helped many more organizations and watched many more boards struggle with this, I've, I've just constantly seen that there are these limiting beliefs or mindset issues or approaches or philosophies to fundraising holding them back. It's not the skills, it's not the list, it's not the assets, it's not the, the, the great programs or the storytelling. It, at the end of the day is really coming down to the first thing you need to change is getting them like geared up and excited and wanting to do this and the sense of accomplishment that you raised a portion of what's gonna go be done in the world this year, right? The greatest contribution you can make is marshalling resources. And I, I tell nonprofit leaders, they are entrepreneurs. Non nonprofit leaders are entrepreneurs. Yes. We make something out of nothing every day. And we are unencumbered by what we don't have today in, in pursuit of creating something that we see. Our, our mission is off in the distance. We are not encumbered. Any inventor, any entrepreneur doesn't have the, the, the clear line of sight of what's going to look like in five years. They know that they're going to start pushing toward it. That's what nonprofit leaders do. We set a vision or a mission and we start building, we marshal resources to go make that thing happen. And so in a way as entrepreneurs, if you think of it through that framework that we're really entrepreneurs, that we, it's, just a, it's just another challenge to go solve instead of like this uh, series of favors that we have to ask. It's really just solving a problem. Yes. And I love what you said. You're unencumbered by what you don't have, right? Like, cause that'll all solve itself, right? In an entrepreneurial world, it is, you know, you, you're moving forward. And the, the language I use, and that is the idea of like sovereignty. So I remain sovereign. Like I stand in my value. If that person says yes or no, you know what I mean? If I raise this or not, I, no one gets to tell me, you know, how valuable I am or how valuable my, I, we, I decide, you know, I, I decide. And I think that's, so what I see a lot of, and I'd love to get your reflection on this. Like I had a client once and she said, we want to be seen as credible. And I don't feel like we're seen as credible, but so if these people would give them money, then they would be credible. I'm like, mm, it's the opposite. You know, when you see yourself as credible, then people will invest in that. They're not going to invest in something they don't see. You know, so it, it's 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 sort of an it, it's more of an inside out game that I think most people realize. Yeah. Uh, okay, so tell me tell me a little bit more about like your experiences as an ED, because um, you've done a lot of stuff. We had a call a couple weeks ago, and you've done pretty much everything. <laughs> so so tell me tell me like uh, give me like what was the craziest or you know most 
dramatic thing that happened to you leading an organization? Um, well, I will say that, yeah, what my, the thing I'm most pr sort of proud of is that my career has been very, uh, um, varied. I've just done a lot of different things. Yeah. Some people could look at that and say, oh, he can't stay in one place for too long. That's not what's happened in my career. If anything, opportunities have emerged and I've either moved for love and then ended up in another career. They're, they're not just like jumping around because I'm uninterested. But because I've done a wide variety of things, C3s, 501C4s, political campaigns, candidates, uh, worked all over the country and worked on a wide range of tasks, communications, helplines, everything. Um, I've just seen a lot of stuff and that helped me prepare for, for leadership too. So in terms of like a funny story or an interesting story or a wacky story is that, um, you know, I think with each executive director role, there's been different challenges, but one of the ones that I think was really uh, crazy was I moved to North Carolina in 2008 for my first ever executive director job. And I was a man from the North, a Yankee. <laughs> Northerner. <laughs> My yeah. first executive director job, it was a women's reproductive health organization in the South, which is like, a, that's like a difficult part of the country to be doing women's reproductive health. But they gave me the job. I was never been an ED before. I was a guy running a woman's organization. I was from the North, already an outsider. And I arrive at the job and I start realizing that some of the, we had debt that I didn't know about. We also had just made some decisions nationally that were hurting our fundraising that I didn't know about. Ooh. And we also, then the economic collapse happened. This was August of 08. So then all of a sudden the money, the the, the sources of yeah. revenue were collapsing around us. All of these things were just kind of crumbling around, right? But <clears throat> I had surprised the board by moving to North Carolina with $30,000 or $25 or $30,000 in commitments from donors because I really wanted to get this job started on the right foot, thinking I was arriving at twenty-five dollars or 30000 from these 10 donors to, to have some, some, some extra money. And then I realized all these problems and I had to use that money just to like fill the holes. Right. But if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't raised some money as a surprise, when I arrived on the job with $25,000 in commitments, we would have been in a really tough spot because we were mostly a C4 organization, which is harder to fundraise for. So we pulled it out. We were able to stay the same size. We passed some legislation. We had a really great run through the economic downturn, 08, 09. But it was a really scary time. And I was just like the only man in the country running a chapter of this organization. And so there, it was my first executive director job. I was really stressed out. But we, we ended up pulling it out. But it was a crazy time to, to see debt and hemorrhaging cash that I didn't know about. And then also the economic collapse. It was just a really crazy time. Okay. And you raised like twenty five, thirty thousand dollars before you even started. You're like surprised from, from men, from ten men in Michigan who supported my LGBTQ advocacy wow. in Michigan. I said, I'm going to do this women's health work, and we all care about this too, don't we? Great, help me get a good start in my first executive job. And they said we would love to help you get started. Here's a gift. Here's a gift. It was a reputable organization that they were giving to, so it was really good. But it was sort of like it became lore in North Carolina that this guy showed up with all this cash on the first day. Uh, but thank God those those commitments came in because a month later those donors were drying up. Those donors were like really hit by the impact yeah and yeah I yeah yeah I guess the moral for me when I hear that is it's it's always okay to ask it's never it's always a good time to ask right like there's never a wrong time to ask I, right. I always go oh we're gonna wait till this comes out there that never happened you right. know this this perfect thing word because that's what oh we're gonna wait maybe nothing will go wrong um, no, it's, that's... it's one of the things I tell people, like we can't be the buyer and the seller. Each time you don't ask, you're being the seller and the buyer. You're making yes. a decision for someone else when they're going to give. I'm not going to hold back who I invite to my fundraiser because I'm afraid that they're not politically aligned or I don't want to ask my uncle. I don't want to ask my neighbor. Ask everyone, ask all the time, because if you every time you hold back, you're you're making a decision for someone else, what they'll participate in. And you can't be the buyer and the seller. When you're fundraising, you can't say, Oh, can you give us 10 grand? Oh, I know the economy is really bad right now, and then talk them out of it. You have to be the you're the seller. You're absolutely going out there to, to sell this organization. Yeah, and you're allowing people to decide for themselves. And and when I coach and train people in influence, that's one of the biggest principles is the more decision making power I give someone, the more likely they're to decide what I want. So if I say, hey, you know, I, I, I do calls all the time and, you know, I, hey, if you want to talk about working with me, that's, that's great. If not, that's okay too. It's totally up to you. And more often than not, they'll say, oh, well, I'd love, I, yeah, what is it like to work with you? And it's the same thing with a donor. Like, 
whatever you decide is totally okay. Like, I, I'm not tied to any outcome. I'm not tied to this. And what they're like, well, tell me about it. Because because now they feel they get to make an empowered choice. Anytime we give somebody an empowered, even if it's a no, it's still an empowered choice. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, and that that can only serve you in the long run. Yeah. Um, okay. You said um, one of the bigger pain points we have is um, you um, is you love helping boards and EDs and fundraisers and startups. Like, let's talk about the board um, and the role as fundraiser and how you support them. And here's something I say that most people have never heard: the board owns the nonprofit, and all owners of all corporations, including not-for-profit corporations, are responsible for revenue. Period. The board owns the corporation. <laughs> All owners are responsible for revenue. They have to pay their bills legally under the duty of care, duty of loyalty, duty of obedience, and all 50 state corporate law. You have to protect this little asset, this corporation that the government has given you some special pr privileges and rights and tax advantages for being a business. You have to take care of this thing. So when a board passes a budget, they can't just be there for the spending. They have to be there for the raising. They have to resource the budget they pass. Anything else is irresponsible. So when boards own the corporation and owners of corporations have to pay the bills, boards are responsible for you know owning this corporation and, re and they're responsible for revenue. And when boards hear this, they're like, I've never heard this before. I've never heard that this is sort of like an obligation. And the minute I vote on that budget, I'm now responsible for implementing that budget, not just my executive director. I have to, this is like my our values, right? I got to go do something with this thing. So that's one of the things I tell boards is that you own the corporation, so you got to protect it. Do you feel like if you would say to a prospective board member, well, when you join this board, you're going to be an owner and they're like, whoa, I don't. Well, I don't want to do that. <laughs> if you do it right, you can fill them with a sense of esteem and prestige and pride and empowerment. You have been selected by a, a one of millions of people to be an owner of this corporation. All we ask of you is that if you set things in motion, you be responsible for those things. So if you want to pass a smaller budget, you raise less. If you want to pass a big budget, you got to pitch in more. It's all up to how much you want to do and how much you want to raise. And if you can find good fundraisers to put on the team, great. Maybe then you have to do less. But in general, I'm inviting you to become an owner of a corporation that is going to solve major problems in our society. Are you in? Right? I think most people would be like, yes, I understand. This is going to be hard. All goal theory and movement, like behavior change theory, shows that if you re reinforce to someone and remind them, yes, change is hard. If, if, if There's actual data to back this up. If your friend comes to you and says, I really want to lose uh, weight for my New Year's resolution. And you say to them, oh, that's going to be easy. You're such a strong person. That actually kind of deflates them because it isn't easy. It's hard. But if you say to your friend, that's actually a really difficult thing to lose 20 pounds for, for New Year's. But I think you can do it because you're such a strong person. So one, you legitimize that the change is hard because most if most efforts that change fail. <laughs> so if yes. you reinforce that this is actually really hard, and yet I think you can do it. Whenever you're doing corrective uh, stuff to your employees who aren't performing well, you remind them, it is because I have such a high opinion of you, what I think you can do that I'm giving you this feedback right now, right? So when you tell a board member, your this role is really important and you're not even compensated for it. What you get is not profit, it's impact, it's results, it's change, it's prestige. That's what you get for being here. Are you in? And I think that that works. I'm in. <laughs> I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Like, you know, I'm like, what? I, you know, so I, I want to go back to, I want to tap into this a little bit because I think this is so important because it's about raising and holding a standard, right? This is the standard that we hold. You either rise to meet it or no, it's okay. And so many times we lower our standard because we need that body. We need that person. And instead of like devaluing the relationship, and I think people are afraid to ask for too much, but actually when you ask for it and you hold it, people will, people will rise to meet it. They, they, they truly will. Or they'll be like, yeah, that's not for me, which is okay too. But now, you know, like you're being honest about it. And I love what you said about, Hey, we can make big changes or not. And, and that's up to you, you know, and, and if then you're going to raise more and, and if, and, and we'll figure out how to do that. And, yeah. and, and, um, and give, giving them like true leadership because the yeah. issue with the board is they bring people on like, but then the ED feels like they have to lead the board, but the board, and it, it becomes sort of a weird dynamic. But in this sense, it's, hey, you're the owners of this corporation. Yeah. That's really powerful. 
I and think, I, I have never heard anybody say that either. So thank you for that reframe. Yeah, it's that. Just, it's a, such a more powerful story to tell. It is. It's a little shocking. And then people all of a sudden squirm in their seat a little bit and they're like, oh, this makes me uncomfortable. This means I really am going to have to either leave this board or step up. Right. Yes. And, and so I'm a big believer also, we have to have high standards for our board, not low standards. The old way was I just need 12 carbon-based people to make 12 meetings a year. Will you just yeah. kind of join me? Give me, give, me give me 12 beaten hearts. <laughs> right, exactly. And now it's like over time, it's like, actually the race to the bottom doesn't really work. I would rather be a small, lean organization that kicks butt, right? I'd rather do three things well than 20 things poorly. I'd rather have a small, mighty board that is engaged and passionate and there for me. But that just might mean we're smaller. And not all organizations have to grow. Not all organizations have to scale. Sometimes being small gives you an evolutionary advantage. All larger creatures have not been evolutionarily advantaged in history. Small creatures always outperform larger creatures through evolution. So small organizations can actually do better. They're more nimble. They don't have an expensive bloated core. They, they're just more built for change. And so if you just focus on staying small and mighty, even having a small board, but high quality board, you'll, you won't pull your hair out. You not everyone has to grow. Everyone's just telling you scale, scale. And it doesn't have to be like that. Be part of a coalition, do your niche, do it well. And once I decided at that women's organization to decide not that I, I didn't have to be 10 staff, I could actually comfortably be three or four and just do it, stay in our lane and just do what we were doing. It just let all the stress go. You know, we'll just work in coalition for the stuff we can't accomplish. But once you decide to actually stay small, it just relieves a lot of stress. The constant expectation of growth, like the weighing on, like you haven't, it's, it's sort of like you haven't built your house and you're putting on an addition. <laughs> it's like build your house, you know, live in it, you know, and then, oh, now it's time to grow. It's like, I feel like what you're saying is there's a, con there's a kind of a continuous pressure. People feel like they need to be growing and it's okay to just stay, stay where you're at and really hone in build something strong, lean, efficient. I, I feel like really, this is the power of the story that you tell. If you tell yourself we're small and we don't matter, that, that's the story. That's, you know, or if you tell yourself we're small and we're lean and efficient and super powerful, then that's that's what'll happen. You can tell yourself whatever story you want, whatever tell story you say, well, that will be the truth. You know, you'll yeah. always be right. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that some funders and foundations will ask you, how will your solution scale? How will you scale? How will you be able to impact many more people? And that's the wrong question. The real question is, how do you how, show us that what you do works? Show us that what you do work. It doesn't have to get bigger. We can replicate, we can have 50 of you in 50 cities. You don't have to be the group that covers all 50 cities. We can have 50 right. of you. But you know, there's a chapter based and small and community based organizations, they move at the speed of trust. And so like they're able to do certain things that big organizations can't do when they parachute into a community. Every organization has their niche, but that scale thing, this pressure to grow, I got to pay my staff more. I must have more money. I got to grow. It's not always serving us. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Sean, you're really smart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but I am passionate. No, just say thank you. You just receive that compliment. See, I work with people on receptivity. Just receive that. Yes, I am. You are. You, I mean, and I can see how your experiences have really honed, you know, your thought leadership and, and what you contribute to clients. It's, I would love to know, and I'm, I'm sure some people would want to know, like, how do you work with your clients? What does that look like? When I work with my clients, uh, my business is moving more and more in the direction of executive director coaching. I do do fundraising support. I do work with boards. I don't do strategic planning. I don't do a ton of facilitation, but I really do support executive directors and leaders, founders, board chairs, leaders of organizations. And so what I do is I look for transformation. I'm trying to get them from where they are now to where they want to go. And that could be personal transformation, executive presence. It could be uh, being having fewer mindset issues like imposter syndrome or limiting beliefs or feeling isolated in the role as executive director. It also could just be helping them where they're feeling stuck. Sometimes executive directors are alone. They can't be who they really want to be to their staff or to their board or to their donors. They have struggles and stresses and, you know, people say be authentic, but if you're too authentic, then you're sort of like uh, unprofessional or it's like uh, be vulnerable. Okay. Well, you can't cry. So do you really want me to be vulnerable? Like there's all these really tensions. And so these tensions, executive directors are sort of stuck in the middle of like a bunch of people telling them how they need to lead. But when they do do that, they're kind of punished for it, especially leaders of color and women. And so 
in my trajectory, it's like showing them that there is this middle way. Yes, this is the job you signed up for. It is tough. There are contradictions. There's all this difficulty. Yes. Because I've walked this road and because I've gone down this road like you have, I've, I've been there at a resource strapped organization trying to keep all the plates spinning and yet find work-life balance and get paid a living wage. <clears throat> you know, there's a way to do all that. So when I work with my clients, I try to focus on, like most coaches work on, What's the end state? Where are you heading? And then where you are now? Let's close that gap. So yep. that's what this transformation and change uh, change management is supposed to be about. So that's sort of like how I help with help, help people identify for themselves three to five things in six to eight months that we can change. All right. I want to say two things. One is I want to normalize crying. I hate that we're like, there's some stigma about crying. It is, un, that is like, to me, like the, you know, the, the, uh, the patriarchal look at like, oh, you can't cry because that's weakness. Oh, no, that's emotion. People have feelings like cry away. Like anyway, I just like, we want to normalize crying. Everybody can cry whenever you want. And yeah. also I understand how that can be perceived, especially women in leadership, especially women of color. And this is the paradox of the strength and the vulnerability and learning to navigate. Oh, because what we want is like, I'm either strong or weak. No, you're both. You're all the things. And so how can I use all of those tools to my advantage? Um, uh, there's a question I ask a lot, which is, is the problem to be solved or a paradox that we can learn to manage? And a lot of things are just paradoxes that we, they're not going to solve them. Like there's no, there's never an answer of like, am I like this or this? You're all, you're all the things. And I, I, I had a client very, a couple of years ago and he actually lost his job because he was so open and vulnerable and, and became such a powerful leader that the board pushed him out and hired somebody to come in who was more of a yes person and did because he wanted to, they said they wanted change. He started to impart change. You're like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, hold on. And you know, but because when you are authentic and transparent and open, people will gravitate to you. And that's just what started to happen. And I'm sure you see that all the time that people really show up authentically and how powerful that can be. The patriarchy, the white male patriarchy is a really powerful thing. Like white people like things that are written. They don't want to believe things unless they're written. So someone could tell me about all their skills and I'm going to insist that they put it in a resume. I won't believe your skills unless I see it on a reference list or on a resume. Because it's like, like white supremacy is like insisting that things be written. The written word is king, right? And also... Um, we've, we've seen this happen with like working with really grassroots organizations who maybe the like funders are more likely to give money to the best written proposal, not the best organization. So yes. write it in the written word. And these things matter more than actually groups that are getting things done. A group can spend zero dollars laying in front of a pipeline to stop it in, in the name of oil change and uh, uh, climate change, but not get the grant because they didn't write well, you know, but this group is incredibly effective at what they do. Right. And and in the patriarchy, there's also the sense that men love to say, be logical, don't be emotional. But um, men are the most emotional. They're the worst drivers. They're they're the ones causing the road rage. They're the ones that are deeply emotional and, and they're exuding emotions all the time. Yet they don't want, what they don't want is people to look feminine, right? So they're like this patriarchy. So they, they shame things. They're fine with yelling and screaming and all this emotion and John McEnroe on the tennis angry. court. You get to be I angry. That's good. Right. You, you get Your to be sports angry. team can win and you can burn a city and that's okay. <laughs> emotion is totally fine when men are doing it. So this idea that you can't cry, this idea that you can't show emotion and the commitment to the written word versus storytelling and passing things down for 5,000 years through story. Like there's all this stuff we have to dismantle. And as fundraisers and as organizational leaders, we need to spot those things and interrupt them when we see them. And it's up to men like me, white men, who can also see these things in these rooms and stop them. Yeah, I mean- I, we're almost out of time. I want to say what I, that's why I stopped doing like proposals and things like that, because I just don't, I don't play that game anymore. Like it just, and I, so I can see like, yeah, well, if you, you know, tell us, you're like, I, we, we need some help and here's what help we need. And here's how much we want to spend getting that help. Tell us what you would do. Like, yeah, nah, <laughs> right. not, not for me. Okay. Last question. Cause I know we got to wrap up. Um, if uh, we, I love karaoke, uh, it's it's my favorite form of self-expression. So when we do karaoke together, because obviously we're best friends now, uh, are you come to St. Louis? Where are you at? I forgot to ask. In New York, New York in City. New York. Okay, so when I come to New York, because I've been to a couple of really good karaoke bars in New York, um, what are you singing? What's your go-to? Oh, I want to dance with somebody. Whitney Houston is probably it. Or lately it's been Gloria from Laura Branigan. Yes, of course, Gloria. I had to learn to sing that song in uh, 2019 when the Blues won the Stanley Cup because that became 
through a weird at like all these things do and through a weird series of experiences the the big song and and everyone embraced that song so i had to i had to learn to sing which is not a easy song to sing by the way no so, one will cover that song no one will re-record it because out of out of out of uh respect to her and because no one wants to botch it it's such a great song yeah, i like that to respect to laura brannigan but i did because everybody wanted to hear hear that song sean this has been such a beautiful conversation. Thank you for showing up and sharing and giving. I have a new perspective, so I know everyone else does too. This is such great information. Uh, we're going to put it in the show notes, but how can people get in touch with you? Uh, nonprofitfixer.com. All right. And we have your social links and um, we put your social links and um, you got Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. We'll put all those in the show notes so people can can connect with you if they want to learn more. Awesome. Thank you so All much. All right. Thank you. Take care. And that's it for me in this episode of the Influential Nonprofit. As usual, if you want to, um, if you want to get your nonprofit, uh, learn more about influence in your nonprofit, you can get to your nonprofit. Go to the influ Lord, what happened to me? Go to the influentialnonprofit.com and download your up level your influence starter kit. Uh, it has a bunch of goodies just for you to start learning some of these uh, practices that I talk about, things like polarity and all the things that help you manage yourself and your team and your life and your donors and anyone else more effectively. That's it for me. We'll see you next time on the Influential Nonprofit.